Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. Understanding Sin and Its Causes is the fourth assistance group in the Education and Love series. In this presentation, titled Understanding Sin, Mary presents a definition of sin, discusses the reasons for my perception of sin, examines my current reality in relation to sin, compares current life to first century life, and briefly summarizes the Understanding Sin session. Recorded on the 23rd of February 2019 from 10 a.m. in Nooseville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, is everyone here? Yep. All right, I'll just have a drink of water and we can get started. How is everyone this morning? Good? Yeah. It's pretty nice weather for cyclones, isn't it? Like for the fact that we're, in, we're supposed to be in a cyclone. Yeah. All right, we'll get started. So this morning I'm going to give you an introduction to our session, Understanding Sin. And we're going to go over some of the concepts that Jesus introduced you to last night. And I'll give you a little summary of what we'll do in the next two days. So the first thing we're going to do is revise our definition of sin. Now there's some really important elements to this definition. I'll read it out for you and then we can talk about the elements. So sin is the existence of will or desire in disharmony with God's love and principles or the absence of will and desire in harmony with God's love and principles, whether that will and desire is acted upon or not. So you'll remember, I hope, from the previous assistance groups where we defined will and we defined desire. Will is basically my current state, how I am right now with all of my injuries and so on and so forth, and the developed love that I have within me to whatever degree that is. And my desire is my aspirations for the future. So when we're looking at the definition of sin, we're saying if any of those things, how I currently am or what I want in the future, is out of harmony with those principles that we learnt about in the last assistance group, then I'm in a state of sin. Everyone looks so concerned about that. <laughs> Because we all know where we're at, don't we? But the truth is, we need to know that that's where we're at if we're going to change it. And we've got the tools to change it. Now, also crucially is this one, and I really want to just highlight this with you, the absence of will and desire in harmony with those principles. Because I know a lot of us, for example, when I read out the first half of that definition, everyone goes, oh, yeah all that stuff I've got to get out of me, you know, it's like so bad. But we can't neglect the importance of developing the positive will and desire because equally we have a responsibility for that. That's a part of the self-responsibility that God imposes upon us to develop that positive desire. I know a lot of us focus on what is in disharmony within us but we negate the power of developing positive desire. Yeah. And equally, essentially, whether that will or desire is acted upon or not. Again, Jesus mentioned this last night briefly where he said often we assess sin based on our actions, but God assesses sin based on what's in our heart at any given moment. So we need to understand that moving forward. Now, the causes of sin are very interesting because basically the causes of sin are the existence of will or desire out of harmony with God's love and principles or when will and desire in harmony with God's love is absent. Now, isn't that the same as our definition for sin itself? So that tells us something very important, doesn't it? 
that sin basically begets sin, doesn't it? By having sin in us, we create more sin. And that is the cause of sin, is having that stuff in us. The effects of sin that I create in this state, we'll talk about a lot in your second session. But very briefly, I create them when my will or desire is exercised either out of harmony with God's love or when my will and desire in harmony with God's love is absent. So basically, if we understand the definition of sin, we also understand the causes and we know there's going to be effects. We know the cause of future sin, it's being in this state, and we know that there will be effects because we're in that state. Make sense? Yeah, okay. So let's just have a little chat. We're going to go back to Jesus' discussion last night and talk about our perceptions. Now, remember he talked to you about how we all have these virtual reality glasses that we put on and we go, yeah, <laughs> my life's all right. <laughs> or maybe I've got a few problems, but it's not really because of anything I'm doing. It's all those guys out there. We live in this state where we try to kid ourselves that everything is basically okay and I'm basically okay, don't we? Yeah. Because of that, because we want to be in that state, we detune from what sin really is. Our perception of sin has been altered by these glasses, hasn't it? So we don't even recognise a lot of times that sin is going on because we're in this virtual reality zone. So let's look at what colours our perception of sin. As I said, it's defined by this personal virtual reality. And we do make it very pretty, don't we? You know. All right. There's a lot of reasons why we don't really understand sin already. The first is our childhood experiences. They colour what we decide is sin or not. But a lot of us want to get stuck there, don't we? We want to say, yeah, I've got all this sin and yeah, it's all because I was never taught the right thing when I was a kid and I got really hurt and how can I be expected to deal with that? And that is then us in a state of denying the fact that we have a personal choice right now. And that's the self-responsibility that we talked about in the previous groups. We also have a lot of corruption in what we view as moral and what we view as good and what we believe is the right thing to do. So because we've got these distorted ideas within us, of course, we don't really see sin clearly. Our whole perception is skewed. So that's why we're going to speak a lot about these themes during this week to help you start to identify sin in your life, in yourself. Corrupt faith. Now, this one is very powerful. And in our third session, we'll talk a lot more about this in a lot more depth. But we need to understand that because our faith is not pure, it's not in harmony with God's love and principles, then our perception of sin is also, it's not the true perception. See, when we've got these glasses on, we've got our own version of reality. But God's version of reality is still going on all around us all of the time. And we have this option to take off the glasses and see what's really happening all of the time. But these four things often combine to make us not want to do that. Let's talk a little bit more about the childhood injury. So we know by now that there's multi-generational sin or multi-generational injury that comes down to us. Even before we're born, we start to absorb it and then in our early years we absorb that as well. And that is essentially because of the desires, the will and desire of the previous generations that were sinful. It's their choices and desires. So, okay, we come into that soup, don't we? And then, 
as some of you may have experienced, our family can get a bit mafioso on us, can't it? (laughs) And in fact, most families do. They have a sense of what we believe is right, what we believe is good, how every person should behave. And when one member of the family tries to do something even a little bit different, a lot of families really oppose them, don't they? They even can make threats, emotional threats. They might not be physical, although in some places of the world it is physical. But a lot of us might have experienced where we start to hear, well, if you do that, then you're really you're going to harm everyone and you're not loving and we can't have you in our life if you're going to change the way that you have a perception of reality. Yeah. So that's part of why it feels difficult to let go of that multi-generational sin. Now, this one's my favourite. Because this is where I get empowered. It's all about my personal choice. But the truth is that a lot of us, we want to keep sinning. We think it's good. (laughs) I like that feeling, you know. I like the feeling I get when I have the chocolate bar that, you know, I don't know, chop down 75 Amazon rainforests to get the very pure cacao. I'm making that up, but you know what I mean. (laughs) Um, Or for some of us, it's like, I like that hit I get when I sexually project at someone and they get a little buzz off that and I get a little buzz off that. And it's a little, nobody really knows. It's not any harm. You know, it doesn't matter where you get your appetite from as long as you go home and satisfy it there, that kind of thing. We like that feeling and we don't want to see the impact that that has. So because of that, because I'm really hooked on that immediate effect, I detune from the long-term effect of that, the disconnection I feel in my life, the kind of dissatisfaction, the hunger for even more and more sexual encounters to get the buzz because my other sexual life is just not fulfilling anymore to avoid that sense of the icky self-worth that starts to grow. And eventually it becomes sickness in my body. But I don't want to know anything about that. So that's why I don't understand sin. And I don't want to see the effects of what I'm doing. And this is really important for everyone of us to start to see. Sin doesn't just affect us, it affects everyone around us. The causes of sin that we talked about, which is basically being in a sinful state, that doesn't just cause me to sin more. It causes a support of other people's sin in the environment around me. While I'm in that state, I support your sin and your sin and your sin. That's a very powerful thing for us to begin to understand. And I don't have any motivation or faith to change. Changing the cause. and. That's why we focus so much on causes here in this room because basically unless we do that, we're going to be trying to deal with effects all of the time and we know that it's the state in my soul, that will and desire, that is going to automatically generate more and more choices anyway that will be sinful, even if I cease just that one little sin. It's not possible just to cease it by changing an action. I have to get to the cause of my choices and make some changes there. Okay. Corrupt morality. This is a biggie as well. A lot of us have a lot of misconceptions about what is moral, and they've come to us not just from our family of origin, but very often through what we have sought out in our lives, what we've exposed ourselves to, the influences. We'll talk some more about influences as we go through the week what I've actually decided to develop in myself as my own moral code. And it's my own moral code. It's not God's moral code. Yeah. Okay. This is a good one for the group because we've talked a lot about emotion, haven't we? And a lot of you have attempted to engage this emotional process. But there is the tendency at times to focus on feeling emotion without focusing on the development of really love-based aspirations within ourselves. And when that happens, you'll find that you don't make much progress 
because that, those two things must come together. Yes, we have to feel our emotions, but it must be with the aspiration to become more moral. And true morality is God's definition of what is right and wrong and God's definition of what is love. Alternately, some of us believe and we attempt to change our values and morals without actually experiencing painful emotion. I've done that a lot, you know, where I see my sin and error and I think I've just got to stop it, but I don't want to feel (laughs) all that stuff that's driving it. You know, it hurts, it feels shameful or whatever it is. So this is ways that our morality remains corrupt. Okay. Emotionally understanding and desiring God's values and morality is the key to understanding and removing sin. So we'll talk about that as this week goes on. Now, if you remember in our second assistance group, we had this wonderful diagram, which I'll put up now. We talked about your real self and how that was obscured because you had sin within you, you were in pain, but you had all these false definitions of love, which include not feeling pain. And because you refused to feel this fear, you had this desire, I'm not going to feel any of that pain, it's not loving. Then what happened was you got into a facade, then all the addictions happened, and then we're seeking comfort and we're kind of angry and then, by, then we just want to go numb and we're in total denial that anything's happening. Now, if you think about it, that's a lot like this virtual reality because we can tell ourselves a lot of stories about how great we are and how great the world is in that place, can't we? Yeah. So when we look at corrupt morality, we have to understand that our dishonesty is a part of our corruption the desire to be in a facade, our sexual immorality, the ways that we act out of harmony with God's love in terms of our sexuality and sexual expression, and financial immorality. There's a lot of that in our society today. We'll talk more about that as the week goes on. All right. Corrupt faith, as I said, this one is very powerful and it affects the way that we view sin. So I actually have faith in what is false. Most of us operate in our lives believing in things that are false and we believe those things for our future. And that has a large impact on the choices and decisions that we make. My corrupted faith tells me to desire what causes my own self-destruction. Isn't that crazy? But That is what we find when we start to examine our lives. We're like, why do I keep acting in this way? What is going on? And it's because we believe certain things are going to make us happy, but they actually cause us a lot of pain. Conversely, and perhaps even more importantly, our corrupt faith tells us that everything about God and the possibilities of living God's way isn't true and it won't work. And that just puts us in a position where unless we change that faith, unless we make some changes in it, we're never going to act differently because we just feel like there's no point. doesn't matter how much our brain tells us, no, this will be good for us. Yeah. So you can see why we get blind almost to sin. We want to not look at sin because Looking at sin exposes all of these things within us, the errors in our faith, the errors in our morality, the personal choices we're going to have to change, and the pain of our past. Hmm. Let's talk about what's really real, (laughs) not not through our uh, virtual glasses. And I want to tell you a story about the Roman Empire So around the time that Jesus and I were first on earth. And some of you might know a bit about society at that time. It's pretty well documented in terms of the Roman rule. And within that empire, the Romans lived an incredibly affluent life. They saw that any excess was good (laughs) 
and that it, it should be sought. So sexually and in terms of wealth, there was a lot of pillaging that happened throughout the earth and they brought all of these riches from other countries back to their lands and they built these incredible buildings and monuments and they felt that food and drink and sex and, <laughs> and slavery, all of this was just the way to live. It was all condoned and, in fact, it was looked up to. The more wealth you had, the more important a person you were. And it didn't matter the means that you received that wealth from. So morality was completely absent in most people's lives, God's morality. And there was a faith that these things would bring about glory from the gods, really, this way of living. Debauchery was very much condoned and addictions and extravagance were seen as legitimate pleasures to seek. And it was into this environment that Jesus came. And his heart then is very much the heart that he has now. It was very much simple in its desire for truth and love and to show people how the benefit of those very beautiful, basic ways that a person can live. And in fact, it was like a healing balm in this incredible environment where there was hardness everywhere. There was hardness all around, and even though people were supposedly seeking joy and pleasure through all of these activities, there was a real detunement from everyone around them and the real conditions in the hearts of each other. Compassion was not a quality that was very well expressed or experienced by anyone. So this incredible opportunity came, this simplicity, this change that was possible was demonstrated and taught. But really, only very few people wanted to listen. They were so caught up in their frenzy of addiction and their compulsion to get more and more of these things that they really didn't hear very much from him. And it was only a few of us who who felt moved and drawn. And many of us weren't from that very affluent strata of society although some were, mm. who recognised this opportunity and the, the beauty that love and truth and that simplicity can actually bring, the connection that that can bring to God and with each other. Mm. So now I want to talk about how it is today because really in preparing this group, I was reflecting on the fact that it's not so different right now in our society as it was then in that Roman society. We might not build big sandstone temples and monuments, but there's a hell of a lot going on out there in terms of big buildings and big shopping malls and bright lights. And there's a lot of consumerism. There's a lot of sexual immorality that's condoned. And there's certainly a huge compulsion that I see growing and growing in society for the next hit, the next quick thrill, the next quick pleasure, the next avoidance, the next bright shiny thing, the next, the internet bombards us and we want more and more and more, don't we? And it's very similar. There's 64 of us here in this room and not many are ready in their hearts to feel what is our real condition and to hear the simplicity and beauty that is possible through having a relationship with God. Yeah. And that's because we're very self-righteous about this, this lifestyle that we have. We believe we're entitled and we believe it's good for us to have it. Others of us are still carrying these feelings of like, I've just got to survive and I need all of this affluence to survive. If I don't have it, I'm not going to make it. 
I really, I've got to keep working, I've got to keep buying, I've got to keep owning, I've got to keep going, all of these things. And we're calling that survival. When really, if you think about it from God's perspective, what makes us the most secure? Being connected to God. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Yeah. And we certainly have a poor perception of our current affluence, do we not? A lot of us feel we're living on the edge when really we're fully clothed, fully fed, we've got somewhere to live and somewhere to go, you know. And here in Australia, we have, we have an incredible system of health and social security, and yet I always encounter people who say how hard they're struggling. And when I compare that to other places that I've been in the world, other places that I've lived, I often think, really? <laughs> because it seems like you're doing really great, you know. But we want to hold on to these perceptions. So if we took off the glasses, if we took them off right now, I'm suspecting what a lot of us would find is already within us, that there is a sense of how hard it feels to live this way and how disconnected everything feels. And that there is, in fact, inside of us quite a hunger, a hunger for some spiritual food, for some love, for some connection. We called it a a sense of spiritual starvation. That's why it's so important to understand sin. It starts to connect us to this process of gain, regaining ourselves. Our current reality, what is it? Are we going to ask that question this week? And do we really want, is this hunger, this spiritual starvation, going to be enough for us to hunger for the truth about sin? Because it really is the gateway, you know. All right. So hopefully that's motivated you to engage with our next session. Very briefly, what we're going to cover in the next couple of days is the creation of sin. Jesus is going to come and speak to you about that next up. Awakening to sin and our attitudes to sin. And when I think about this session, I think about, look, we can't fix what we don't know. So this sin, while, while we all cringe at the definition of like sin is the will and desire out of harmony with God's principles and we think, yeah, I know that's me, a lot of us don't really see how that is true for us. We just have a sense, yeah, I know, well, I know I'm not living that way, so I must be in sin but we don't really want to know how it's really happening. And what we'll talk about in this session is what it is that's happening and why it is we often find it hard to be specific about the things we need to fix. So our attitudes to sin, we'll talk about how we can actually wake up to sin in ourselves. We can't fix what we don't understand and what we don't know. So we're going to be talking about understanding sin and our relationship to sin. You could say we've got a personal relationship with sin. (laughs) So time to get even more personal and understand it. All right. So in the creation of sin, Jesus is going to go through with you again that framework. Remember the God's principles create the framework for the laws and the laws actually create the potential for sin to happen. So you can see why we needed to talk about laws in our previous discussion, in our previous assistance group. It will help you a lot to understand sin. And when you go away, if you put the two groups together, the laws and this one, you'll be able to go, oh, wow. Now I understand the principle and I understand how sin occurs. I can see this is how I'm sinning in a very specific way. So we'll talk about Next up, what is sin, the effects of sin and the causes of sin? 
and we'll discuss how humans not only create sin, but complicate it all. It's pretty simple, really, but we would like to complicate things. It helps us act even more in sin and even re- ignore the results of what we're doing. Yeah. And we are in a state of crisis in, in the world in terms of sin. You just have to watch the news, really, and you can see that it's gotten out of control and nobody has a feeling for morality or ethics in the public world that's perceivable. And that is causing a lot of disillusionment in people to grow and grow and grow. And really, this last point is so important that God wants to help us remove our sin. So God's not up there, arms folded, going, sort it out. You know, you're being a naughty kid. God is so excited if you want to know about it. And God wants to help you remove it. And I really would love to just emphasize that to you guys today. And Jesus will talk to you about it. But you can start to talk to God about your sin. You know, God wants to hear from you. At the moment, we've got this personal relationship with sin. And God's like, hey, could have a relationship with me, personal as well. <laughs> it's just got to, you know, be willing to let go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our second talk uh, of the day today will be awakening to sin. And we're going to talk wonderfully about the process of awakening to sin. So you know what you need to do. We'll discuss issues relating to morality, ethics, moral condition and direction and our moral flaws. That's going to be a theme all the way through, which is fun to discuss, actually, if we let go of all of our judgment. It's really empowering information. We'll have another story time. We'll talk about the story of sin and how it plays out. And we'll, as we said, we'll talk about the process and the requirements to awaken to sin. We want to identify the sin and the sinner and the personal qualities that are required to awaken to sin. So basically that gives you a whole toolkit really to understand am I sinning? Is someone else sinning? Because a lot of us get confused about that. And then what qualities am I going to need to, to develop within myself? Okay. Tomorrow morning, I'll talk to you about attitudes to sin and we'll talk about why it's so important to examine those attitudes. We'll talk about God's attitude to sin, which I just mentioned, and how my personal attitude affects this whole process and where that attitude has come from. We'll talk about some general negative beliefs about sin, of which there are many, and The final thing we'll do is talk about some really common attitudes that most of us have towards sin. And that can help you with your self-reflective process and going, oh, okay, yep, now I can see there's a big issue I've got going on there. Yeah. All right. So that's our session coming up. I hope you really enjoy it. Just remember your sin definition that my sin is my will and desire in disharmony with God's love and law or the absence of my will and desire in harmony with God's love and law. We know that we have this distorted perception of reality and perhaps we're going to see even more as the week goes on just how distorted that perception is. I hope you'll use your question and answer sessions to really help you to personalise a lot of the information we'll be presenting. And we need to ask ourselves, do we want to change? Is that hunger real inside of me? And if it is, am I willing to go to some places that might be challenging inside of myself and in my life in order to no longer be hungry and disconnected from myself and everyone else all of the time? Okay. We'd like you to get to the end of these two days and just really have a good understanding of what sin is all about. And please use the Q&A sessions. They're there for you. Yeah.
All right, guys, thank you. Enjoy your morning with Jesus.